so good to be in a place where people know who he is. Amen. Amen. So thankful. So thankful for, uh, well, well, first off, so thankful for this anointed music team, this praise team. Can you put your hands together for them? Amen. The leadership of this church, uh, this church has been, go ahead, that's all right, that's in order. Go ahead and give them honor. Amen. Amen. This church has been such a tremendous impact, not only to me personally, but globally. There was a global impact that this church has had. Uh, so thankful for the young people of this church that they were able to put up with me for a few services. Amen. You guys have great young people and they're positioned to do something great in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So thankful. Uh, that's all right. That's, that's all right. Amen. Uh, so thankful for Mike and Brother Isaac uh, and what they're doing. Um, I know, I know, I know that just sounds like preliminaries, uh, but I want you to know that if, if, if you, if you have family, whether it be a child or someone you're connected with that is under their care via youth or hyphen, uh, they are uh, in good hands. Amen. And they're being led of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So excited. So excited that we that we're that we're the church tonight. Don't know about you. Amen. I'm not a huge fan of anything dead. Amen. Just just doesn't sit well with me. Amen. Never liked funeral homes, so I'm glad I'm not in one. It's a Spanish song that says it's not a funeral, it's a Pentecostal party. Amen. So so excited to be in the house of God today. Uh, can you guys just bear with me just one more service? Amen. Just one more service and I'll be out of your way. Amen. Uh, First Kings. <clears throat> First Kings. Now, I know you guys don't stand and I understand that you don't have to. Uh, the only thing I'm going to ask is that you just preach with me. Okay. All right. Can you promise me that? Amen. Help me out here. You guys have been so awesome. Uh, so thankful for what I feel here. Uh, so thankful for what I felt this morning. Just really felt ministered to. I really felt ministered to uh, this church has just kind of just been going through so many seasons from the last time I was here to this point in time now. And I just want to add to that. I hope you're encouraged by the time you leave and your spirit is strengthened. Amen. First Kings chapter 17. Uh, I felt this passage and uh, we're just going to kind of walk with the Holy Ghost and see where he takes us. Amen. First Kings <clears throat> chapter 17. Amen. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 8. I'm going to start with verse 8. Amen. The Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Amen. He said, I want you to stay there for a little bit. Don't just pass on by, but I want you to stay there. How many of you guys want the word of God and the words of the man of God to stay in your life? You don't want it to come and go. Amen. Sometimes we don't need a new promise. We just don't do a good job of holding on to the last one we got. Amen. We got to make room for it to stay there. Amen. The scripture says, the scripture says, listen, I, I want you to dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow. Everybody say a widow. There to provide for you. So he arose and went to uh, Zaharaphat. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. Everybody say the gate of the city. Amen. He was, she was at the gate of the city gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hands. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I want you to watch this. I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil. Everybody say a little oil, a little oil in a jar. And seeing I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that I may eat and die, that I may eat 
and uh, and Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake. He said, make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. Make some for yourself and your son. I feel to just minister to you on the subject, it's not your last meal. It's not your last meal. I feel ministering spirits here. We warred a lot this weekend, but I feel like the Holy Ghost is here just to strengthen somebody. Can you just lift both your hands? Can you close your eyes? I'm going to set this mic down, but I just want you to connect with what God's doing in this place. There's just a tender spirit of God here. I just want you to plug in just for a moment. I just want your spirit to connect with what he's doing. I want you just to connect with what he's doing. That's it just for a moment. We're not going to rush this. I want what you feel just to settle in on you just a little bit. It's not very loud, but it's very deep. I just want you to step in that right where you're at saying, don't, don't get distracted, saints. I want you to forget about everything. Plug into what the Spirit is doing. Can you reach just a little bit deeper just for a moment? That's it. Don't bypass this. Can you just reach just a little bit deeper just for a moment? God, I thank you for every person in this place. I thank you you have a plan for them. God, I thank you, God, that you're getting ready to pull people deeper than they've been before. I thank you for the pull and the tug of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, God, that you're getting ready to empty them so that you can refill them with something new. God, I thank you for the promises of your word, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. One more time, could you clap your hands? Can you just offer him up some praise? Can you just thank him for a moment? Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Turn to two or three people. Tell them it's not your last meal. <clears throat> it's not your last meal. Not your last meal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I know there are points in time where uh, I got frustrated with my parents, particularly about school, uh, because, you know, they thought school was something that was very important. And uh, in my ignorance, I didn't necessarily have the same perspective. As a 10-year-old kid, I had other priorities. Amen. They were things that were just a lot more uh, detrimental to where I was going. How could I develop proper social skills unless I played with my friends? Amen. You want me to be educated, but I'm trying not to be awkward. Amen. So felt like they just didn't get where I was coming from. And what made it worse is sometimes they were asking things of me that I did not think they could relate to. Uh, I was privileged, I guess you can put it in one sense, uh, privileged to be raised in the household of two Haitian immigrants. Amen. So they were from the islands, and they did things just a little bit differently. I never heard of the word spank till I was about 20. <laughs> And I found out what it is, and I was like, wow, that's how you were supposed to do it. <laughs> Amen. My mom knew how to handle her business. She didn't know nothing about spanking. I don't know if that word trans translates well in, in Haiti. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, there were moments where I would be bothered because I felt like she just couldn't relate to where I was at. And she was asking me things that uh, she wanted me to do that she's never done before. And so in these moments, uh, I would do them out of obedience, but I did them with some sense of frustration because I felt like you don't really understand how to do this because you've never done this like this. You've never walked this route that I've walked before. And sometimes I don't know about you, 
But there are moments in our humanity, whether we say it or not, we can impose those same thoughts to God. Because we see God as this perfect being, and though he is, without any fault and failure, and he has none. And we sometimes attempt to relate to God, that he does not understand where we're coming from. It's easy for you to say it because you don't have to do it. Amen. You're telling me to put up with these kids, but you don't live with them like I do. Amen. Yeah, go ahead and stay quiet. I know I'm preaching to you. (laughs) Amen. You're telling me to go through these struggles, but this isn't something that you've necessarily had to put up with. And I want to help you understand tonight that we have so glamorized the gospel that we forget that it starts off with God coming into your context. That God, throughout all the Old Testament, all he was trying to do was lift people. Amen. He was trying to lift them out of where they were. He was trying to lift them even in the days of Noah. He was trying to lift them even in the days of Abraham. And you exclusively see this with Moses. He's trying to lift them up to a higher standard of living. This is why we have all the laws that were given. But man seems to fall short every single time God tries to lift them. They just can't meet the standards that he sets. Amen. And so that same God says, I'm tired of trying to lift you. So I'm finally going to come down and do it with you. Amen. Amen. In that moment, you, you have to realize that God, God comes in flesh. Now, he didn't have to do it the way that he did because it was not the first time that God came amongst living beings, the creature that he himself had formed. We see theophanies throughout the scriptures. Even Abraham dwelt and fellowshiped uh, with beings that resembled who he was, uh, but he knew that they were not earthly but heavenly. But I want you to realize that when God comes to the New Testament, the transition is, is that he does not just come to us temporarily, but he connects himself directly into our situation and just settles there a little bit and the scripture says and the word became or the word was tabernacled with us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father can I tear down every false Pentecostal premise that God does not know how to dwell in mess but still let glory be exposed can I tell you God knows exactly how to step into flesh but still make sure the power is revealed. Amen, amen, amen. amen. This, this very same God, this very same God subjects himself to his creation. Amen. It is now the creative father that is now being called a son in the hands of a beggar woman laying in a manger, not even able to clothe himself. He can't even feed himself. He can't even wash himself. He's dependent on man to do everything for him. If he needs something to drink, they have to do it. If he needs something for him, they have to do it. And can I tell you that is the same place we are today. You don't realize it, but God has so tied himself into the relations of the church that if you don't pray, nobody else will. If you don't fast, there's not a gospel coming down from an angel to preach this. But God is dependent on people to work with him in co-laborship. This very same God, I don't know why he did it, how he did it, but that's what he did. He, The Bible says he became a man. Amen. He put on the same flesh that you did. He put on the same limitations that you had. God became a man. God not only became a man, but God settled himself in a dysfunctional family. Stop making the scriptures look prettier than they actually are. Scripture relays the fact that he was born of a woman that was talked about. They thought that she was a woman of ill repute. She didn't have a proper reputation beyond that. God didn't even grow up with his natural, his actual dad. He grew up with a stepdad in the home. You want to go a little further? Daddy dies while Jesus is young. And beyond that, he has family that won't even acknowledge who he is. He grew up in dysfunction just to say, I know how you're living and I've walked it before. (laughs) 
Same God, I don't know why he did it, but that's how he did it. Attempting to relate to us. That very same God goes through the process that would be needed to grow. He subjects himself to growth. I want you to imagine that for a minute. This is the very same God that has no limitations. And now is having to subject himself to grow. That God, in the process of growing, now comes to the place where he is struggling with himself. Amen. And the Bible relays the story that Jesus finds himself. Jesus finds himself after being baptized. The Bible says that he comes to John. And I want you to watch this. That Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And John says, listen, I'm not worthy of you. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy even to tie your shoelaces, so to speak. And Jesus says, no, this needs to be done so that it would be, that it would be fulfilled for righteousness sake. And Jesus goes down in the water. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God began to speak and said, this this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Can I strip you of all pressure? God was not pleased with you after you learn how to run the aisles and put on a good suit and dress real fancy. But the second you came out of the waters of baptism, he looked down and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Can't tell you how many people can't tell you how many preachers struggle with so much pressure because they're trying to get the proper approval from their father and God's not willing to give it to them that way because he's saying I approved of you at your baptism when you were baptized I looked down at you and said this is my son in whom I'm well pleased the same man whose father was probably dead at that time who had a mother who they were gossiping about who came from a family who did not respect him he said this is my son nobody else thought he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth they overlooked him they rejected him they scoffed him they mocked him but he said when earth won't validate you you better remember this all the heaven will stand and speak and say this is my son in whom i'm well pleased uh, help me, Holy Ghost. Uh. same son the same jesus i want you to watch what he does after getting baptized the Bible said that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, begins to draw or pull Jesus into a wilderness. It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness so that he would be tempted by the devil. What kind of kindness is that? <laughs> you know, we always talk about God trusting us with promises. But can I tell you the true test of sonship is when God can trust you with trouble. No, you don't like that. If I'm honest, I don't either. But the Bible says that, that when Abraham was getting ready to die, he gave gifts to all his sons. But the only son that he was willing to lay on an altar and let him go through something was the son that would actually inherit the heir. And we think God is trusting us when he blesses us with a new job or a new car. But the reality of God's trust for you is when he can trust you with trouble. Can I help somebody today? You ought not walk around with your head hanging low just because you're going through something. You ought to let hell know that this is just a sign that God knows how to trust me because he doesn't need to bless me for me to stick around. Amen, 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 amen. How many times do you see people, they only know how to walk in the blessing of God. Amen. They only know how to walk in the favor of God. They only know how to pray when everything's convenient. Amen. And all of a sudden, let something happen. You won't see them worship anymore. Let something, you know what I love? I love when I get a text from my pastor and say, I need you to pray for so-and-so because they're going through this and, and families falling apart and they just got an improper diagnosis and things aren't going the way that they want it to be. But Sunday come up and here that same person is strolling up to the front of the altar and worshiping 
loving God like nothing happened. Can I tell you that's the true test of sonship. When God can look at you and say, I know you don't want the blessing. You want me so I can trust you with trouble. Hey Amen, hey amen. You may be seated. I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. But we don't realize that sometimes God will bless us with stuff just so he can bypass giving you what actually matters. Wants to see where you stand in all of it. Can I tell you, this is where that Shunammite woman was. Shunammite woman, the Bible says that she was a widow. Her husband was gone. I know you understand the context of this story, but just allow me to elaborate just for a moment. You got to realize that her source of provision was taken away. She had no one to sustain her. She lost all ability to gain some source of finances. And the Bible says that she is at the gate of the kingdom. Amen. You got to realize what gate she's at. She's at the gate of the kingdom. What kingdom am I referring to? This is the kingdom of God. The same God that she knew who was Jehovah Jireh. That would be my provider. The same God who she knew that it was Jehovah Nisa, the Lord, my banner. This same Shunammite woman. This same woman is now speaking to the prophet. And you got to understand Sometimes contradiction can exist in you because you can know something about God and not be seeing it. And your life does not commentate on God's preeminence. Your situation, listen, I, sometimes we adjust things, we adjust doctrine just so our story can fit in it. We'll change our stance on healing just because someone didn't get delivered or healed. And the struggle can be for you to believe that God is still something, even though it's not being manifested before you. Here she is. The Bible says she's gathering sticks. I won't be too long with you, but I want you to see what the scripture says. The Bible says actually she's gathering sticks. The prophet goes to her. And the prophet says, can you get me something to drink? He said, I just need some water. I just need some water. And the Bible says while she was going to get him something to drink, she didn't come back with the water yet. In the midst of her preparedness to go sacrifice, the prophet said, no, come back. Now, I, I, I've read this a few times, and I didn't really, really realize what was going on, but, but I think I have a grasp of what's happening right now. Because the scripture relays that she's going to get the water, and she says nothing about it. I don't know how this is because they're living in a desert, but, but somehow she had an abundance of water because she realized I could give that. Why don't you go get some water? No problem. I'll be right back really quick. The prophet sees that there's no issue. She stops and says, wait, I want you to go get me something to eat. And all of a sudden, she stops in her tracks. She says, listen, you got to understand. Wait a minute. I, I, I just got a small amount of flour and a small amount of oil. You ever been in that place where it just seems like God's doing everything just to empty you out? The water wasn't an issue. It was like, well, that didn't work. Go ahead, turn around, and go get me some flour and some oil and bake me a cake. And she says, you don't realize that's exactly what I need to sustain myself. Can I tell you, we've lost the understanding of emptiness. Because the prophet knew I can't bless her until I tap the source. Amen. Because the husband wasn't there anymore. He said, I want you to get me some water. That's sufficient for you. Okay. Well, no, actually, go get me some flour and some oil, and I want you to make some cake. Why? Because she understood that the oil and the flour was a lot more important than the water. And God was looking at her through the prophet's eyes, and she begins to say to the prophet, you don't understand. If I go do that for you, this will be my last meal. Amen. Because we have nothing else. You have to realize I'm but a widow and I have nothing else to give you. And it was at that place that the prophet looked back at her and said, if you'll do what I'm doing, you'll find something else to sustain you. Can I tell you, sometimes we limit the miraculous because we refuse to drive on empty. We'll find something else to sustain us. How many times did God want to take you deeper in prayer, but you had to go ahead and call a prayer partner to sustain you? 
How many times did God want to take you to another level? But you had to find something to comfort the very emptiness you've been trying to avoid and not realizing that the provision is fine in an empty barrel. Throw Psalm chapter 23 for me if you can. Psalm chapter 23. Can we just walk through this just for a little bit? I won't hold you too long. Psalm chapter 23. Psalm chapter 23. Most of you guys know that you can quote this with me. The Lord is my shepherd. Amen. I shall not want. Next verse. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. Amen. Next verse. Amen. Amen. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I want you to stop right there. Everything up to this point is just blessing. Everything up to this point is just provision. Everything up to this point is just green pastures. It's just the power of God via the shepherd taking him to still waters. It's just, it's just the provision of God making sure that he had sufficient food to eat. But I want you to watch. There's a transition that takes place in verse 4. Put up verse 4 for me, please. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to realize what defines a valley is that it's an empty place. Amen. It's a place where there's lack of something. And the Bible says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff has comforted me. Verse 5, I want you to watch what God says. He said, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I want you to realize the oil did not come in the blessing. The oil came in the valley. The presence didn't come in the blessing. The presence came in the valley. And sometimes it is the emptiness that you are trying to avoid that God uses to show you where the oil is, to show you where the presence is, to show you where the glory is. Verse 6 for me, please. Surely goodness and mercy. Say that. I want you to watch this. Because I would think that mercy and goodness would go before you. But he says goodness and mercy is going to follow you. Because in the reality, when you're in a valley, you make some very foolish decisions. And I need God to cover up some stuff that I was walking in. I need goodness and mercy to follow me. Can I tell you there are some things that you will never learn in the mountaintop. That was the issue with Peter. Is that Peter wanted to experience God's permanent residing presence at a high place. He said, listen, Elijah's here. I want you to realize Moses is here. You're here. Why don't we make a tabernacle? One for you, one for me, and we could just kind of dwell here. For, how many of you guys ever felt that way? You get in a really good altar call and you're just, if I can only stay here. The mountaintop is how you see God's promise. The valley is how you get there. And if you don't know how to walk a little bit, and some of you are afraid of walking because you're stumbling, but can I tell you, even when you're stumbling, mercy and goodness is walking behind you and clearing up the mess so no one can see what was going on in the valley. Clap your hands unto the Lord if you believe that. I wish you'd lift your voice and shout out to God if you believe. Give me a few more minutes. Just be seated. God's about to do something. I want you, can I, can I, can I clear you of the guilt of what you did in the valley? Can I tell you, even God himself in his lowest moment was still crying out, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? In this place, I want you to realize what the Shudamite woman did. The Shudamite woman, she says, listen, prophet, you don't realize this, but this is the last meal that I have. I have nothing else to offer. And the prophet speaks to her very clearly. He says, for thus says the Lord, God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up. As everybody say, it will not be used up. Say it one more time. It will not be used up nor shall the jar of oil run dry everybody say it won't run dry say it won't run dry 
He said, listen, I want you to realize you've been hoarding the oil that you have in your house because you've been concerned that there's not enough for you and there's not enough for your family. But God said the prophet went to the woman and said to her, if you will trust me and empty yourself, the oil that I'll give you, it won't run dry today. And matter of fact, it won't just be enough for you, but it'll be enough for your kids. The oil I'll put on you will be enough for you and your family. Hey, the hardest place to believe God is when you've emptied yourself. But if you ever emptied yourself before God, it's one of the greatest moments you could ever have. Can I tell you, sometimes I feel like we hold back in prayer because we're just, we're just afraid to empty it. We just refuse to empty it. We don't know how to pour ourselves out. Can I tell you what happens? Usually what we, have, what we do is, and I saw this during pre-service prayer, it's like we, 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 we pray with just enough oil so we can get to the music part of the service. We pray with just enough anointing. And then when worship comes, we pray with just enough, we worship with just enough anointing just so we can get to the word. And then when the word comes, we pray with, we, we preach with just enough anointing just to get to the altar call. And after that, we have enough cake just for me to eat. It satisfies me perfectly, but, but, but I don't know what you're going to do, and I don't know what you're going to do, and God forbid there's lost people in the house, and God forbid I got backslidden a family, and God forbid there's, there's, there's places that the Lord is calling me to minister because I only got enough oil for myself. And the Holy Ghost spoke through the prophet and said, if you would learn the process of emptying yourself, you would realize that this would not be your last meal because the scripture says in Psalms chapter 23, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You know, it's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing to learn to eat before the devourer. When you realize when I learn to empty myself out, it is at that moment moment that God can provide supernatural resources. I'm challenging this church. Stop being satisfied with the measure of oil you've been giving. God's calling you to empty yourself. I want you to stand to your feet and lift your hands all across the building. <laughs> I want you to stand to your feet all across the building and lift your hands. <laughs> So if you don't remember the last time you emptied yourself before the Lord. But the Holy Ghost sent me here to tell you that this won't be your last meal. You've been surviving on just enough long enough. You've been surviving on the bare minimum long enough. But God's saying, I'll give you the well if you give me what you have. I'll give you the spring if you give me what you have. Church, I'm calling you back to that type of prayer where you would empty yourself out. When there was nothing else left, you didn't even have a voice to get into praise and worship because you knew how to empty yourself before the presence of God. <laughs> She got dying. Shaye la masaye. Shaye la basaka taye. If this word is resonating with your spirit really quick, can you move to the front for me, please? Can you come to the front? Come down praying. Don't just walk down. I want you to walk down praying. Come 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 down praying. I want you to come down praying. But there's about to be an emptying in this place. There's about to be an emptying in this place. And can I tell you, when you empty yourself in this place, this won't be your last meal. This won't be your last meal. You're about to learn how to eat before the devourer. You're about to learn how to experience what the oil feels like. You're about to learn what it feels like to get in the presence. When's the last time you shut everything out? You shut everyone out and you just emptied yourself just a little bit. You poured yourself out until there was nothing else to give. You prayed until there was nothing else to pray. You got lost in the Holy Ghost because you emptied yourself. You emptied yourself. 
You can survive on just enough or you can learn to empty yourself and experience the power of God. Come on church, that's it. That's it. It's about time we learn how to give everything and let God provide the rest. Give everything and let God provide. You've been holding out long enough, but God's saying, if you give me what you have, I'll give you what I have. If you give me what's in your hands, I'll give you what's in Provision is loose when emptiness is revealed. Provision is loose when emptiness is revealed. Was the last time you poured it all out before him? You poured it all out before him. It wasn't just a passive thing. It was a it was a permanent thing. It was an intentional thing. he won't despise a broken heart my friend he won't despise a contrite spirit my friend he's near to the broken hearted to those who know how to empty themselves your vessel will never run dry if you know how to pour it out you'll never need oil if you know how to pour it out That's it, church. That's it, church. This is the empty. This is the empty. This is the empty. When we break before the Lord and everything that's been staying in their way too long needs to flow out. Everything that's been stagnant in their way too long needs to flow out.
You've been trying to figure out how's he going to provide for that? How's he going to perform that? It's in the process of emptying yourself. It's in the process of emptying.